ETF Prime is hosted by investment advisors at the ETF Store and sponsored by Leg Mason. Leg Mason sponsorship is not an endorsement nor a recommendation for any product or service. Leg Mason Investor Services LLC is not affiliated with the ETF Store, ETF.com, or any of its affiliates. The ETF Store is not affiliated with ETF.com or any of its affiliates. ETF.com's participation in this program should not be construed as an endorsement or an indication by ETF.com of the value of any ETF store product or service. This program is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. All investing involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. The ETF store owns and is responsible for all program content. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Leg Mason is a leading global investment company committed to helping clients reach their financial goals through long-term actively managed strategies. Leg Mason offers a broad range of equity, fixed income, alternative, and cash strategies worldwide. It is comprised of a diverse family of specialized investment managers, each with their own independent approach to research and analysis, and has over a century of experience in identifying opportunities and delivering astute investment solutions to clients. To learn more, please visit LegMason.com. Now it's time for ETF Prime, where we discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate will help you get up to date with what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of ETF Prime, Nate Geraci. All right, thank you so much for joining me. As always, I also want to thank our exclusive sponsor, Leg Mason. So last week, I was on the ground in New York City attending the J.P. Morgan ETF Symposium. This was a tremendous event, so it wasn't just focused on ETFs. There were a number of other topics covered as well. As an example, if you're familiar with the uh, J.P. Morgan Guide to the Markets, they had Dr. David Kelly speak, so he actually helps put that guy together. He's JP's chief global strategist. And I've got to tell you, he had what was probably my favorite session where he gave his outlook on the financial markets and, and global economy, just an amazing speaker. Uh, but there were panels on everything from using artificial intelligence and investing to portfolio construction to the future of ETFs. They also had a general... Odierno, who was the chief of staff for the U.S. Army uh, from 2011 to 2015, he gave a keynote that had the room absolutely captivated. He walked through how he views the geopolitical landscape right now. Uh, so we talked China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, and it was incredible hearing him sort of go through his chess moves on each of these countries. But in any event, Last Friday, ETF.com's Dave Nottig and I had an opportunity to sit down with four different J.P. Morgan resources, and we hit the record button. Uh, we had about 10 to 15 minute conversations with each of these individuals, and I want to play these for you now. Uh, first up is Jillian Del Signor. She's a head of U.S. ETF distribution at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. And we start by spending a few minutes on J.P. Morgan's ETF business, which there are some pretty remarkable stats here. They launched their first ETF in June of 2014. Didn't really do a whole lot for a few years. But then I would say last year, or maybe even going back to 2017, their ETF business really took off. And they now have about $30 billion in ETF assets. They're the 10th largest ETF provider. And personally, I think their arrow is pointing up. I expect them to continue climbing up the ETF leaderboard. But Jillian starts out by explaining what the ride's been like over the past five years as their business has grown. And then we get into ETF education, bond ETFs, non-transparent ETFs, a number of interesting topics. Take a listen. Wow, it has been it has been quite a ride. So uh, we launched our first ETF, like you said, in June of 2014, JPGE. And that really was a kickoff of what has become uh, a really exciting suite of multi-factor ETFs. We were one of the first out there in market with those products um, and have since really built out, I think, a lineup that certainly was very deliberate in the way we approached it. We always knew that we wanted to be able to provide our clients uh, in all investors with a product suite that crossed over equity, fixed income, and alternatives. And that's precisely what we've done. And we've provided them with 
with tools and building blocks as much as um, complete solutions. So what I mean by that is if you think about, we have our multi-factor products, but then in 2017, we actually launched single factors. So for those that want the total solution, you can use something like JPIN, you know, our uh, billion dollar plus international multi-factor ETF. Um, but if you prefer to get more um, nuanced in your exposures, you can have a JQA or a JVAL, you know, quality or value. Um, and then we, we started to get into alternative beta. So some of our um, alternative beta, you have JPHF if you want the complete solution or some of the sleeves as well, like a JPMF for managed futures. Those are some of the most groundbreaking, I think, and some of the we are most excited about. Um, I know alternatives in a, in a raging bull market, alternatives are not the thing that people always want to talk about, but it is starting to surface a lot more recently um, as this is getting a little bit long in the tooth and, and um, you know, investors are looking to, to diversify um, their portfolios. And so those have been to take hedge fund-like exposures and bring it into a transparent, liquid, low-cost wrapper was really compelling. And we were able to leverage our existing capability coming out of our quantitative beta strategies team, um, who actually started in long short before going to long only with our multi-factor product, was, was really exciting for the marketplace. Have you found it difficult to sort of talk to the advisor community about what are arguably more complex products than the sort of super low-cost beta we're used to talking about? Definitely. Client education has been a huge part of what we've been doing. Um, and, you know, you talk about the, the acceleration of growth we've had in the last couple of years. And I think we always knew it was going to be a bit of a hockey stick, right? You're bringing new products to market from a certainly not new in terms of asset manager, but new in terms of ETFs. But I think bringing that, bringing that we brought our existing investment capability into the ETF ecosystem, it was actually pretty compelling. And so folks knew us as an asset manager and as a very successful asset manager. It was a matter of helping them understand who we were going to be in the ETF industry. Um, and so to be able to build out a lineup that was allowing them to construct a portfolio across equities, fixed income, and alternatives, but then also, you know, Dave, to your point, across disciplines, right? So we do have more plain vanilla market cap weighted beta in right. our beta builders. Right. We also have purely active, like JPST, which is our nearly right on the precipice of $10 billion at $9.8 billion, um, active ultra short duration fixed income, but then also factor based. So we really span all disciplines as well. And it's allowed us to have very holistic and consultative conversations with our clients. You uh, gave an opening keynote yesterday where you talked about in 2014, there were three projections that you had. Uh, one was that ETF uh, AUN would grow to $5 trillion. Yeah. Two, that there would be a lot of product innovation, including in fixed income and active ETFs. And then three, that we would see commission-free trading. Right. So these were projections in 2014, but given that all of those things have occurred. <laughs> What's next? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes, so are, tell us yeah. what we should next. Are, are you surprised? <laughs> and then yes, tell us tell us what's next. Yeah, I know. So that, I, I, I take no credit for the research report that I found. <laughs> um, but I thought it was incredibly compelling that everything they were predicting in 2014 is precisely where we sit. But like I said, the next slide that I went to was, is it, is it actually what we're talking about as an industry? And it, it actually is too, although you include some things that I would argue are more noise and, and sort of trendy versus true themes. But as I think about fixed income, you know, fixed income ETFs have fundamentally changed the way we invest in fixed income today. For sure, for sure. And yeah. I, I think we're still on the front end of it. You know, this, one of the stats I had was that there's $87 billion in active um, ETF assets today. That is going to continue to grow. Oh, it's tiny. It's I, tiny yeah, compared yeah. to the overall marketplace. And so there's such an opportunity in fixed income, also in equities, but you know, in fixed income right now, for us to continue to grow that. And we have been a huge participant in that and represent about 10 billion of that 87 billion in our products, in, in JPST uh, in particular. And so we do think that there's a lot of a lot of white space out there still to, to be sort of harnessed as it relates to fixed income. And, and yet, you know, we, we've been in this incredibly interesting fixed income market for the last mm -hmm. few years, yet we still see money flow into, you know, I would argue pretty plain vanilla index-based right. fixed income product that honestly, is not particularly great. I'm not a big fan <laughs> of fixed income indexing. Most fixed, um, fixed income indexes don't make much sense, right. yet the money shows up. So is there a gap we need to bridge to investors who have looked at ETFs as you know purely low-cost passive beta to help them realize their other options? I mean, yeah. it seems like we have a huge educational problem in front of huge us. Huge education. I think, it's, I think it's two things, right? So I think it's, um, number one, lack of choice. There have not been a lot of product in market. Um, 
And so we actually, if you look at our, our fixed income lineup, I think it's like now a third of our um, whole suite is actually fixed income ETFs. Um, and they're all act well, most active. We have one beta builder and then we have two factor based, which I'll talk about as sort of my second point. But um, there's a lack of product choice. Um, if you look at the overall asset management industry, the bulk of the flows actually go into active fixed income. But if you look at ETFs, the bulk of the flows goes into passive. passive fixing, right. There is just a lack of choice. But I do think there's an education gap. I think investors pretty much know what a market cap weighted index is on the equity side, right? The, the money goes into those largest market capitalization, and, and that is sort of well understood in equities. I don't think it's understood that in fixed income, the more debt you have, <laughs> the more you, the get. More you yeah, get, right? right? And that just seems backwards. Um, yeah, 100% and, agree. And I also don't think they understand how much the Bloomberg aggregate index has changed over time. And the ballooning that we've had in the, the corporate space, um, and in particular, the triple Bs. The triple B, yeah, yeah. And so that is what I think we are trying to illuminate as, as an organization. And you'll actually hear later today, um, Eric Eisenberg, who is the PM on JAG, that's one of my favorite tickers that we have. Um, I want to hand out those little pins with the, the pilot <laughs> of the JAG. Um, but JAG, I think, is, is a very groundbreaking product. It's one of the first factor-based fixed income ETFs, um, our second, but one of the first out there. And it's been challenging to bring products like JAG to market because of the, the data that is necessary to truly construct it. If you think about an equity world, if you want to look at like a GE equity, there's one, right? You look in fixed income, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 different bonds For GE, attached to right. that same company. Right. And so the, the, the number of years that we've spent, Eric's been at the firm for three years and we just launched JAG in uh, several months back. So I think that there, this is just the front end of that, but helping investors understand not only what a, a market cap weighted fixed income index is and how it is different, and then also how the ag has changed is a really core component of what we're focused on right now. Well, I, I also I continue to think that the ag may be sort of the worst thing the industry has ever foisted on the investing public because you know at least things like you know the big stalwart indexes people follow are things like the S and P five hundred, right? Right, a completely logical way of approaching the investment yeah. problem. The ag makes no sense. I mean, as you point, it's got the deadbeat uncle problem, which is you're giving <laughs> more money to the person right. most likely to never give it back yeah. to you, right? The most most indebted person, uh, but at the same time, it's it's also kind of random. Like what's in there is just sort of there's no particular reason why you've got this much exposure right. to financials in there or this much exposure to treasuries, mm -hmm. and you're cutting off whole other parts of the bond market that you know just don't exist in the ag. So I mean, I, I feel like there's a, a huge gap, but at the same time. You know, you point out the sort of GE problem, right? Mm -hmm. You've got 30, 40, probably, it's probably more like more hundreds of, yeah. of GE bonds out there, some of which will never trade again, right? Yeah. They're held by insurance companies. They're going to sit there forever. So it's just a different kind of market. So it's not just that there are 100 GE bonds out there. It's that some of them are inaccessible, which yes. you'd never think about in the equity space, right? I, I think what's happened is there's been such a focus on passive management on the equity side of the equation, and we've all seen the numbers, and it has been challenging for active management to generate outperformance. I think investors have automatically made that assumption on the fixed income side. They just, assume, side. It right. they just yeah. assume it works for bonds. They just it works for bonds, and that's why we've seen that. Definitely, and in fixed income, actually, active managers have had a much better track record of outperformance. And you know, the ag is one of those things that um, it's changed so much over time. And folks have used fixed income, core fixed income, as that ballast in a portfolio. But it's changed so much. We're finding in our conversations, they're starting to be more willing, once they understand the things that we're talking about, to start to look outside of that. But we also recognize that with launching JAG, we are asking someone to remove a core of their portfolio. Right. So the way we constructed it was actually to duration and sector match it back to the Bloomberg Aggregate Index and just take a value, quality, and momentum screen to the corporate sector. 
So to use a much more thoughtful approach to selecting bonds, which we would argue there is no more important time than now, given the fact that it's so ballooned and is the highest it's been in 35 years yeah, and we have in huge, triple Bs. Right. We have a huge, huge balloon in the bottom of the investment grade. Yes. But at the same time, we're in the middle of a corporate earnings recession that nobody's mm -hmm. talking about. And that's kind of a bad thing to have Absolutely those two right. things at the same time. Yeah. yeah. And so for... You know, we were we were very front footed with putting Jag out there and recognizing that we are trying to solve for the problems that, frankly, some investors don't even know about, but that we want to educate on, and do it for seven basis points because, again, this is a core part of someone's fixed income portfolio. If we're asking them to fundamentally kind of replace what they're doing, we want to be able to do it in a way that doesn't include a huge tracking error or right. a huge expense. Yeah, you can't compete for low cost beta mm -hmm. if you're not competing against low cost beta. beta. Right. Yeah. Jillian, I want to pivot the conversation to the equity side sure. and. Uh, you mentioned there being a lack of product choice, and obviously J.P. Morgan is working to try to fill that gap. You want to solve client problems. A hot topic right now is non-transparent ETF. So Presidian has active shares. Um, I, I'm curious just to get your thoughts. There's been a lot of debate as to whether or not those products can gain traction, uh, whether or not they solve an asset manager's problem or solve an investor's problem. What are your thoughts on that? You know, I'm, I'm excited, you know, again, transparent or not, I think active equity is a space that we have an opportunity to continue to fill um, the, the gap in product in, in the ETF world. Because we think about the landscape, you have investors that have really valued active management um, across equities and fixed income, and also are starting to understand and appreciate the efficacy of the ETF wrapper. And so right now, it's fairly unproven what the, the marketplace is going to look like, but we are certainly quite bullish on the opportunity to bring some of JP Morgan's um, expertise in managing equi active equity products into the ETF wrapper to try to solve for that investor that is looking for that capability in the ETF wrapper and bringing some of the things to the mark to uh, those investors that ETFs can bring. And why not launch active strategies in a transparent wrapper? That's certainly on the table as well. I think that you know there are certain um, spaces and certain exposures that we would certainly be comfortable bringing out in a transparent wrapper. I think you've seen that from other issuers to date as well. Um, but then there are others that just are um, better suited in a non-transparent form. And you know, to your point, thanks to uh, the technology of Presidian, we'll be able to do that in short order. Where else do you see opportunity on the equity side? You mentioned the multi-factor products that J.P. Morgan offers. Where, where else is there opportunity outside of just pure active management? We're actually seeing a lot of interest in our single factors uh, recently. I know that's to, to your end, to back to uh, factor space, but I really do see a lot of interest in single factors. We actually did something this year. We called them our factor forums, and we took our team, um, our uh, portfolio managers, and uh, our portfolio insights team, which I think you heard a lot about during our time here together, and I can certainly touch on a little bit more. Um, we took it on the road. We took that show on the road. We went to 11 different cities and talked about not, I think we've really graduated from what is a factor, at least I hope we have. We as JP Morgan certainly have. Um, and more, how do you implement, right? How do, factor port, how do factor ETFs fit in a portfolio? And so that was the crux of this conversation. And we were able to introduce in a meaningful way a lot of our single factor products, as well as JAG. So we're seeing a lot of interest in quality uh, ETFs right now. Um, and we've helped a lot of clients identify their lack of quality in their portfolios, unbeknownst to them in most cases, through portfolio insights, through these model analyses that we've been doing. Do you, do you worry that the, I, I, we've certainly seen this in flows, right? If you look this year, we've seen huge flows into Minval, and we've now seen flows coming out of momentum. I think one thing I worry about is that factors are just the latest way that folks that really want to be active are just timing the market in a different way. And that, that makes me a little concerned because mm -hmm. you can get just as burned chasing factors as you could chasing sectors or chasing individual stocks yep. unless you have like some real grounded thesis behind why you're doing something. Yeah. Do you worry at all about that, that, that the factor products become just another way of trading? I think that factors are incredibly cyclical. And so we would be the first to say it's incredibly difficult to time them. And so when we're talking to folks about single factor, it's not necessarily as sort of a, a hot trade, if you will. It's much more as a, a 
core, if you will, in their equity portfolio that they're using to potentially, if you think about, if you do a diagnostic on a portfolio and you find that you're really overweighted to lower quality, can you input a quality ETF to help offset some of that? So we are the first to admit that timing factors is incredibly difficult. Um, and we are having these conversations much more in the context of how do these fit more um, it, within the entirety of a portfolio. Because I'm with you. I mean, the flows into Minval have certainly been ironically very volatile <laughs> um, right and so and have started to demonstrate characteristics yeah. like momentum yeah right no, it's, yeah so yeah. absolutely we we've certainly been if you look at where our flows are it's certainly much more into quality and for the contrarians although i heard I don't know if it was you. I forget who said it. Is it really a contrarian to be talking about investing in value right now? Right. Um, just given how long um, we've been talking about it. Um, but we've actually seen some interest in those that are looking to potentially jump into value at this point as well. So, Jillian, I think we've talked about some things that will certainly uh, play a major role in the ETF space moving forward. What else is on your radar? What has you excited about the future yeah. of ETFs? So there's a couple of things that I think about. One, we've talked about, and it's fixed income. I think that despite the fact that we already have 300, I forget what the number was I said yeah, yesterday, totally 373 agree. ETFs in market, there's so much white space out there. Totally agree. Um, so yeah. that's what I'm really excited about. Um, the other thing I'm excited about is um, model portfolios. So that's something we'll be talking about today. I think as you look at the landscape, there are um, a lot of advisors out there that are looking to um, – asset managers like J.P. Morgan and others to help them construct portfolios. You know, we have a panel later today, and as we were doing some prep for it, one of the panelists is something I thought was really interesting, and he said that he was equating the model portfolios to ETFs 10 years ago, where there was a set of um, investors that looked at ETFs as a threat to their business. And it took some time before they realized, no, actually, they add a lot of efficiency to my business and actually help me scale um, and bring in more clients. And so that's, I think, where we kind of sit with model portfolios. There's a set of folks that look at them and they say, no, 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 I do that, right? And not thinking about the fact they can actually help you scale your business in a meaningful way and probably touch a set of clients that maybe you were turning away in the past. So we've focused a lot of time on um, our model portfolio business are continuing to lean into it um, within our multi-asset solutions capabilities, um, all ETF as well as some hybrid models across mutual funds and ETFs, and bringing that capability to our clients. Um, I think the, 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 the change in the NTF platform certainly has opened up a lot of opportunity there as well as our clients are actually fundamentally rethinking their own models, right? Not necessarily looking to us to provide the model, but saying, all right, everything's now commission-free. Right. I'm going to rethink the way I constructed my model. And so that's where our portfolio insights capability has walked in, to, in the door. And so that's kind of my third exciting pu uh, push is like engaging our clients in complete model analyses as they rethink their allocations in light of this incredible change. Do, but isn't there a really thin line between saying you're going to provide model portfolios, you're going to work with the advisor community to help them work with model portfolios, and crossing that next step towards like true robos, where you're saying, hey, there's a model portfolio, why not just put the client directly into that and take the advisor out of the equation? I've heard that fear from a lot of advisors. Absolutely, that's. I'm sure that's a fear that they have at J.P. Morgan. We are true believers in the incredible importance of the advisor in uh, the conversation. If you look at our, um, our mutual fund business, our ETF business, our complete asset management business, we are focused on the advisor and have continued to build product and build solutions. Think about our guide to the markets, our portfolio insights, right? We actually put all of our resources into helping advisors have conversations with their clients about markets, about portfolios. So we are absolutely um, in, in a place where we believe that they play a really critical role in the engagement with clients. Well, Jillian, this has been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. So that was Jillian Del Signor, uh, who we've had on the podcast several times before, but I, I really enjoyed catching up with her in person. Again, I think if you listen to her, it's easy to see why J.P. Morgan has such a bright ETF future. She's extremely uh, passionate about the business. Okay, next up we have Ben Mandel, Research Analyst, Multi-Asset Solutions at J.P. Morgan. And if you haven't seen this, J.P. Morgan just released their 2020 long-term capital market assumptions. Highly encourage you uh, to track this down. Just an amazing amount of research where they put together projections on economic growth and how different asset classes might perform over the next 10 to 15 years. 
I found this to be a fascinating conversation because we all know how stocks have had a spectacular run over the past 10 years or so. Of course, bonds have had a tremendous run as well. But I think some investors are starting to become concerned over what that might mean moving forward, right? Our returns going to be lower because we've had such a great run. We get into all of that here with Ben. We also talk politics, trade war, central banks, the impact of technology. Again, really enjoy this. I think you will as well. And Ben, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Okay, so JP Morgan just released their 2020 long-term capital market assumptions. And this really lays out the key themes that JP Morgan sees impacting the economy. Uh, and of course, market returns over the next 10 to 15 years. First, can you just tell us a little bit about what goes into putting this together? Sure. Uh, I'll start by saying it's a firm-wide endeavor. Uh, so I'm, I'm part of a very broad uh, community of analysts who think about the macro environment and the specific asset class returns to help us project out into the future 10 to 15 years. The process itself you might characterize as making some of our most heroic of all the heroic assumptions we make, <laughs> uh, and we make a lot of those, uh, in the, insofar as 10 to 15 years is a long time. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it's significantly longer than our usual tactical time horizon of about 12 to 18 months, which is what we think we can extrapolate into the future based on what we see in the, in the, in the world today. Uh, in some sense, however, it's an easier endeavor to go out 10 to 15 years because you're abstracting from some cyclical phenomena. So you can take a step back from the question, when is the recession going to happen? Because over 10 to 15 years, you One's circumscribe full exactly. cycle. You're right. going to get one uh, at a minimum, and you'll have enough time on either side of that to make up for it. And so 10 to 15 year forecast is a question of what is the underlying structure of the economy? And what are the underlying fair values for the asset classes? And those uh, uh, entail a somewhat different toolkit for how to make your forecasts and one that uh, is, is simpler in some sense. So, On, on a yeah. scale that long, how much does political concern almost dwarf economic concern? Because, you know, you know on a, on a one-year basis, yeah, politics matters here and there. You get a, you know, an announcement here and there. But now you're talking 10 years, right? That's more than a full, you know, two terms of a president. Do you take that into consideration, and do you take that into consideration sort of globally in all the various markets? That's in the U.S., not China, though. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> well, the, 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 let me answer your question with a question. To what extent does, does politics matter for some of the structural underpinnings yeah, right. of the economy? And so the way we look at the world, and we, we do this for each one of the major regions, is to, is to start with the economics and to say, what is the growth rate of uh, this, or, this economy or that economy over the next 10 to 15 years, which is the basis for a lot of the other asset class returns? And that, in turn, is a question of uh, what does the, you know, how fast is the labor force going to grow, which is a demographic question. That's somewhat easy and somewhat orthogonal to, uh, to politics, right. uh, because all the people who are going to be in, in the workforce over the next 10 to 15 years have already been born. Right. Right. So that's, you know, there's not a ton of uncertainty around that aspect of it. Where there is a lot more uncertainty is, is, is around the other contributor to growth, which is productivity. So the long run, productivity is not everything, but it's almost everything. It's about two thirds of the contribution of total growth. And uh, it, it hinges on things that we, we have a difficult time predicting. It hinges on how fast is the technological frontier expanding. Uh, and it hinges on things like the, you know, the policy environment that firms are operating in and uh, the amount of uncertainty that, that goes around that. I, I have to say, uh, where, where we kind of think we can hang our hats is more on the technology side than the politics side. And so our productivity forecast is a, is a question of how fast are we uh, moving out? Uh, how does that compare to the past? And are we in a period of relatively high or relatively low technological growth? Uh, policy, I'd say, does come in uh, somewhat but particularly for emerging market economies where we think that's a little bit more influential at the margin. Sure. Uh, so some, some of our EM uh, economies had a downgrade this year, uh, Mexico, Brazil to be uh, specific. Uh, and part of that downgrade was coming from pro lower productivity. 
which comes from a less favorable combination of, of growth and inflation from the policies that we think are going to be put Got in it. place in those economies. Harder to make that uh, a, a big contributor in the U.S. or other DM economies. I mean, do you have to make bold predictions around things like the adoption of modern monetary theory, you know, infinite QE, zero interest rate policies? I mean, do you, you must have to put markers down at least to say whether or not you think things continue as they are or move in a vector to the left or the right. Absolutely. So, so monetary policy, we, we actually have to take a, yeah. a stand on, not just for our economic forecasts of, of growth and inflation, but also for fixed income. What is the path back to fair value from what we view as you know, kind of expensive uh, valuations right now for bonds? Uh, part of that is a more general statement about what the business cycle looks like uh, in general. This has been a very long, very flat cycle. We think uh, that that pattern will persist into the future insofar as what's contributing to that in part is, is monetary policy. As uh, rates are down near the zero lower bound uh, and where we'd expect them to be during the next recession whenever that happens, monetary policy efficacy goes down. You enter what's commonly known as a liquidity trap because the, you know, the, right. the ability of policymakers to push inflation back and push growth outcomes back to normal uh, is lower. And as a result, in these longer, flatter cycles, you spend much more time below normal levels of growth, inflation, and policy rates than you would, would otherwise. So to your, to your question, we do take a stand on, on the shape of the cycle and where we think policy efficacy is relative to history. And what that's giving us is a flatter contour with relatively low inflation and somewhat subdued policy rates relative to where we think equilibrium is. And, and that's, you know, for, for the frame that you're using, which is 10 to 15 years, you just sort of see that as the status quo going forward. Well, yes. I mean, so smoothing through whenever the next recession right, is, we right. anticipate at some point we'll be at the zero lower bound. At some point, uh, you know, policymakers are going to have to deal with that asymmetry in outcomes around normal. Uh, clearly, that's a significant issue currently for Japan, for Europe. Uh, the Fed is, is doing its, its utmost to avoid that, that outcome by trying to build in some more asymmetry. Can they target above 2% inflation in times of expansion to make up for the shortfalls during uh, recession? Uh, that's an experiment they're running at, at present, right? right. And, and we'll see what the results are. But I think it's fair to say that uh, you know, there's a flatter contour of the cycle, uh, probably lower uh, average inflation and policy rates, and probably flatter curves over the course of the, the average business cycle. So Ben, from an investor standpoint, we've been in this 10-year bull market in the US. You mentioned perhaps bonds are uh, expensive at this point. Um, I think there's a feeling among investors that perhaps future returns have been pulled forward. Mm -hmm. So as you look at the capital market assumptions that JP Morgan put together, is that reflected in those assumptions? Absolutely. So we view these uh, assumptions as cycle neutral because of the whole recession timing issue, but they're not cycle agnostic in the sense that your starting point matters, right? And as you go through the cycle, bond valuations uh, improve and, and equity valuations deteriorate in, in, from a forward-looking perspective, right? So as equities get, get richer, uh, you know, there's more of a decrement to expected returns in the future uh, by going back to fair value. Um, and so where we are right now is in a situation where everything looks rather expensive compared to their fair values. Uh, so going back to in some sense, a summary statistic for this whole exercise is where we expect, what we expect expected returns to be uh, right. for the 60-40 portfolio. Uh, so a global balanced portfolio, we think, is a 5.4% return, which is about the same as it was last year, and low in historical context. Part of the reason it's low is that things are expensive. And as you go back to normalize the fair value for both bonds and equities, uh, that's a decrement to future forward-looking returns. Uh, and so it's not really just the structure of the economy that gives you lower returns. It's the fact that we're at a certain point in the cycle. What about international stocks? I think when investors look at valuations across the globe, I know emerging market stocks in particular yeah. are pointed to as, as perhaps an area of opportunity. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think when, when you say the, the number 5.4, inevitably people start looking for what are the high numbers else. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Where are the high numbers on the page? Where's yeah. the top? Exactly. Right. There's something above 5.4. What is that? 
And uh, you know, it is it is global global equities and emerging markets in particular. EM uh, equities have a nine percent return in our in our assessment, and part of that is the fact that growth is inherently higher there. Right. And so the that real GDP gap between developed market and emerging market equities is a three percent difference. Right. So you're, there's a pickup in growth coming from convergence dynamics elsewhere in the world. Uh, there's some caveats around that. For, you know, China is slowing, et cetera. And I don't think we're, you know, we're not overly ambitious on where we think Chinese growth will be. In fact, somewhat conservative. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, when, even when, when you account for that, emerging markets is where the growth is. Right. The second issue is valuations. And so the fact that U.S. equities have run uh, and had such a great uh, run up over the course of this expansion uh, relative to Europe, relative to Japan, UK, the emerging market uh, economies. That means, from a forward looking perspective, you know, you get a pickup in just, relative just terms. Just from multiple expansion on the emerging markets? Exactly. Just yeah. or, or you, don't, you, you expect less of a decrement in, uh, right. in, sure. in the non US markets than you do in the US. But it's a relative gain for outside the US. Um, and, and finally, the other thing is the dollar. So if you're a U.S. Uh, investor holding unhedged exposure to international equities or, or bonds, uh, we expect you'll get a tailwind from a dollar that will depreciate over our 10 to 15 year horizon. In fact, that's really the, the standout characteristic of our FX assumptions. Not a lot of the crosses it's a weaker look- weaker dollar. Yeah, yeah, not a lot of the crosses look expensive except the dollar against everyone. Last question, I think we've done a good job on hitting all of the major uh, items at a high level. We talked about policy, we talked about central banks, we talked about technology. Is it correct that you are a professor of international trade? <laughs> because I have to ask you about the trade war, uh, because that's obviously front and center with investors. Yeah. Just any thoughts as we talk about emerging markets, you talk about China's growth. Yeah. What's the potential impact there? And is this something that, as you look longer term, 10 to 15 years, is this going to be with us for a while? Is this a short term phenomenon? Yeah, so the trade war is a symptom of a, of a broader strategic rivalry between the US and China. Uh, we do. We're not ignorant to that to that context as we think about the growth the growth rate we expect for China in the future, and now we expect that to be 4.4 percent. Part of that, actually, I'd say the majority of the downgrade from where we, you know six percent currently, five percent in last year's assumptions, is that China has grown very quickly and GDP per capita is passing through a point where it's no longer a, 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 a you know low. In, in, in the perspective of uh, broader development, and you'd expect it to slow down as other economies passing through similar thresholds have in the past. Uh, so part of it is that, but, but you know, to be frank, part of it is that the external environment is less friendly than it was to those convergence dynamics that give you faster growth. And so I think uh, at the margin, you know, that, that, that plays a, a role in, in some emerging market forecasts and specifically, specifically China. Uh, you know, d- we're, we're, we're optimists at heart, I'd say, and I think that uh, the, everyone has an interest, both politically and, and economically, to come, for, to come to some arrangement, uh, whether that is, is decreasing downside risk from you know, potential, pot- tariffs potentially causing a recession or something like that, um, uh, or, or generating significant upside. We think it's more uh, avoiding the worst case scenarios here and uh, continuing a broader long-term strategic rivalry. Well, I love the idea of ending on a note of optimism. (laughs) Ben, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. That was Ben Mandel. And I should have mentioned earlier, the uh, 2020 long-term capital market assumptions are available for free at am.jpmorgan.com. That's am.jpmorgan.com. You can also get the uh, guide to the markets that I mentioned at the top of the show as well. Okay, next, Dave and I sat down with Steve Kaplan, co-head of Global Product Strategy and head of Portfolio Insights at J.P. Morgan. So his job is really to focus on portfolio construction, helping advisors understand the strengths and weaknesses and opportunities within their portfolios. And I thought he was the perfect person to follow Ben, because after hearing Ben describe the challenges investors might have in store moving forward, uh, that we could see a much lower return environment over the next 10 to 15 years, we were able to get Steve's thoughts on potential solutions to that, right? How does an investor get from a 5.4% return or whatever to where they actually need to be? And that's exactly where we start with Steve. So take a listen. Steve, great having you here. Thanks for having me. So I wanna start, we just visited with Ben Mandel and uh, looked at the long-term capital market assumptions and 
one thing that obviously clearly stood out to both Dave and I is the long-term projected return on a globally diversified portfolio, 5.4%. I think a lot of investors may see that and probably rightfully have some concern about how they get from point A to point B moving forward. What are some things that you think investors should be considering as they look at maybe a lower return environment moving forward? Yeah, we, we do spend a lot of time on this. There's a lot of conversations about resetting the expectations as, as we talk to advisors about their portfolios. The, the conversation, long-term capital market assumptions, first of all, are a really important starting point in terms of the base of a portfolio. But that's just the starting point for beta, if you will. The, the other two components are really going to be around taking advantage of opportunities a bit more tactically, right? So there's the long-term capital market assumption, 10 to 15-year time horizon. You know, our teams will look at tactical as more of a 12 to 18-month period where things will play out. You want to have both of those in your portfolio. And then ultimately, part of how you implement that in the underlying investments that you select Right. Things that are, you know, being fee conscious is obviously something that comes up a lot, but also having things that can generate more returns, more alpha in a portfolio. Those three things together are really what we're talking about in terms of bridging the gap from where capital market assumptions are versus where clients probably would like to be. Right, because the capital market assumptions are based on the assumption that you're in a 60-40 portfolio that looks a certain way. And obviously, within that, say, within the equity portion of that, you've got every country, every sector, every approach. Some of those are negative. Some of those will be positive. And so it sounds like your job is to sort of try to tease that down into something that's more actionable that gives people the hope that they're going to do better than 5.4% for the rest of their lives. Exactly. It's, yeah. it's really the conversation of what are you trying to achieve and then balancing the returns that you're trying to get with the risk that you are willing to take right. in the overall portfolio. I'm curious, you have a unique opportunity in that um, you can drill down and look into portfolios for all types of different advisors and investors. What are some of the key issues that you tend to see? What are some things that advisors are doing or investors are doing that maybe raise an eyebrow? So Dave did just, just touch on this a little bit. One of the biggest challenges is finding income, first of all. I think everybody knows that you just alluded to the negative negative rates overseas. I mean, even even in the United States, it's positive. It's it's you know obviously more palatable than what you're getting, but these aren't big numbers. So what, one of the biggest things that we are having conversations around is as income and the search for income continues, we see everybody overstretching in some way because people aren't going to government oriented portfolios for income. They're going to multi-sector type strategies. They're going into things like high yield or emerging market debt, things that are a little bit further out on the risk spectrum on the relative basis. Or they might be buying more of a multi-asset portfolio that focuses on income or an equity portfolio. What those things all have in common is they all feel the same in terms of, of credit slash equity type risk. So while your yield might be better than what you may get your in a more- risk is through the roof, yeah. And, and that, that's probably one of the biggest points of conversation. How do you balance those two things? What are the things that you can do to, to not only just focus on the income or the bottom line of income, but to balance out a portfolio? Do do you think we're in a, a phase, and, and maybe this is a phase shift, where you know a lot of advisors have historically spent time with folks at the end of their investing life cycle, you know, people who are in retirement, generating that income with the idea that you know, hey, if I can get seven, eight percent out of the portfolio without having to make any transactions and I can live on it, that's the way. That's the way you retire. That's the way you draw down is by taking income out of a portfolio. Is that an antiquated way of thinking about it? Because if, <laughs> you know, it, it strikes me as, I mean, I've, I've talked to a lot of advisors focused, for instance, on the high dividend yield space. But if you just buy the top line yields, often you're just buying the most garbagey value trap companies out there. Should we be just throwing income away and just be thinking about total returns at this point? Well, it's a really interesting question. I don't know about throwing income away, but what I but but I think where you're going is first of all, income is a massive part of total return in equities, sure. as as you're well aware, right? So there's there's that aspect, but I do think there's a little bit of diversify in a different way, because if you look, going back to the capital market assumptions as an example, there's there's a lot more of of open markets and access to things that the traditional client may not have had in the past. You find a lot of more alternative-oriented investments, say real estate, for example, where you can get better income 
and diversification from traditional markets in a portfolio. So you're, you're, you're still getting some more income, but you're, you're not necessarily sacrificing the benefit of diversification. So maybe there's one approach of, of going a little bit further beyond what you do today. The other component is where, and where, where I do agree with you around total return is that focus on I, get, I need a headline number of what my, my coupon or dividend yield is, and I'm just going to live on that and, versus reaching for it. Are you better off just taking a portion out of your, your value, your principal, your return, and using that to draw down as needed? Potentially, yes, because the, the flip side is if you overstretch for income and you have a lot of the same risk in a portfolio, the risk you have is the market may do that for you. Right? Right. If there's a really bad market, <laughs> right. right, you're going to lose the value anyway. So you right. may as well be better diversified and pull out as needed versus having the market dictate it for you. And I think that's probably yeah, a little yeah. bit of, of probably what you're, sure. you're, you're alluding to, right? Yeah, ab- absolutely. I mean, I just, I, I hear this obsession with, uh, as you put it, that sort of coupon or dividend, that top line number. And it just, it makes me concerned because you're seeing more and more you're seeing funds that do this. You're seeing people's portfolios that do this that are reaching without looking at the other side of the equation. And that just makes me really nervous. I also think, just to that point, that that locking into whatever a number is and that being the number is part of the challenge. Call it 8%. I need 8%. And I'm going to try and get match that 8%. Markets change, things change, situations change. It's the markets are fluid, portfolio right. values are fluid. So therefore, shouldn't the way you withdraw money be somewhat fluid based upon your your situation? And that's actually, I think, where the value of an advisor be, comes in, right? It, it's you know, what are your needs? How do you make sure that they're actually met? Steve, I'm curious. Uh, in visiting with Ben, we talked about international stocks and, in particular, emerging market stocks, and maybe there's some opportunity there longer term if you look at where they're currently valued. When you look into portfolios, do you tend to see an underweight there? Is there a significant home country bias? And, and how do you go about sort of painting the case to be more diversified internationally? So it, it, the answer is emphatically yes. And this has been a trend that we have seen. It, this is not a new thing. Forever. Yeah. Right? We've seen it for, forever, as you said. The, the, uh, now, with that said, it's gotten worse. Home bias has gotten worse. It's gotten worse. Do, do you think that's just a reflection of what the market has done here in the U.S., just chasing performance? Chasing performance and or not rebalancing. Because if you think about what's uh, happened, yeah. the broader trend we see in portfolios, especially on the equity side, is bias towards growth. Bias towards growth, I mean, what stocks have really been driving the markets? It's really been more growth-oriented names in the US. So we see an underweight towards value holistically, right? And we tend to just think of splitting value and growth more evenly as opposed to making a specific call. But, but more importantly, that international exposure, it's always been underweight because of the home country bias. But what we find is that the, the degree in which there's underweight has increased. So when we look at, at our portfolios, and we work a lot with Ben's team, they'll start with a capital market assumptions long-term view, and then they will tactically overweight and underweight. So let's just say ballparking it that the in a 60-40 portfolio, if you're thinking about the equity piece, that you would say more strategically it should be 35% in international. The tactical component of that would bring it down because of views to 30%. What we see in client portfolios is around 22. So I know I just threw a lot of numbers out, but the, the point there is, is that even from a vantage point of tactically being underweight international, what we're finding is, is that clients are even more underweight than the tactical underweight we have. So, I mean, yes, there is there's certainly just an opportunity not to overweight international developed and emerging, but to to just get back more towards a, a balanced weight, especially given where, where markets have been and valuations are. Last question, an area I want to make sure we touch on, alternatives. So alternatives in a portfolio haven't really worked well over the past 10 years or so. Um, talk, talk about the use of alternatives in, in a portfolio. So we, we have a lot of conver- we have more conversations on alternatives than we actually see in terms of implementation <laughs> in a portfolio. That makes sense. Right. Yeah. So everybody's so, interested, but nobody nobody puts the bet down. It, yeah, and, and it's and, you know obviously it a little bit comes to how you define an alternative. Of course, I would say it's not that alternatives haven't necessarily worked. I think it's that when you look at it, goes back to the same exact question of what U.S. markets have done. 
it's been really easy to buy the S&P 500 or just be in large cap equities in some way, shape or form and look back and say, anything else I would have done in terms of diversification. Yeah, everything's worse. Yeah. Just hasn't worked. The, the part of the issue is what happens going forward. And that's where, you know, obviously, we continue to, to meet new and new highs almost daily now. But at some point, is that is that going to continue? And so there is a lot more conversation around alternatives. I would also say alternatives get painted with a very broad brush. Yeah. So I would, would say that it's been a bit more challenging on the hedge fund side before. M more often is the conversation of exactly what you're talking about, where it's been challenged. Things... Above and beyond that, we talked about real estate as diversifiers, private real estate, private equity, private credit. I mean, that, that actually, I think, has picked up a bit more in portfolios and has, has actually worked a bit more in terms of, when I say worked, I mean meeting, meeting the expectations that were laid right. out to clients. I think for the hedge, fund, the hedge fund space, it's been a bit more, it's been a bit more challenging relative to more traditional markets. Yeah, it's tough to, tough to argue for market neutral when we've got a bull market that never seems to end. And cash at zero. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Steve, tremendous insight. Really appreciate the time today. Thank yep. you. Um, thank you for having me. That was Steve Kaplan. And I do think it's going to be really interesting watching what happens in the alternative space, especially alternative ETFs. To, to me, this just seems like a category that could uh, gain traction if the financial markets aren't as cooperative moving forward. Uh, I, I think definitely an area to watch. Okay, last up we have... Yasmin Daya Bilgers, head of America's beta specialist team at J.P. Morgan. And at the symposium, J.P. Morgan demoed some pretty mind-blowing technology. They call it ThemeBot, where they use artificial intelligence to search through millions of pieces of data for 10,000 plus stocks. So ThemeBot combs data sources like news articles, regulatory filings, company profiles, and then it can identify the stocks with the highest exposure to a particular term or theme. So say you want to find stocks linked to some ESG theme, maybe a low carbon technologies, ThemeBot can do that. And so we visit here with Yasmin about what artificial intelligence is, how it fits into investing, how JP Morgan is implementing it. And I thought this was a perfect conversation to end with because this gets to the future of investing. There are already a handful of ETFs using AI, but I think we're just scratching the surface right now. So here's Yasmin on artificial intelligence. I thought it might be good to first start with just defining what artificial intelligence is, because I think people see this term thrown around. Uh, some people think of robots from the future, right? What, you know, it's gonna take over the planet. What is artificial intelligence? Yeah, that's absolutely the right place to start because in fact, I think it's the terminology in this space that can really confuse people. So there's really three, th three terms I think that are worth defining. The first is artificial intelligence, which for us is just an umbrella term that refers to really any technique in which a computer is mimicking human behavior. When you actually double click into it, there's subcomponents, and one that often gets talked about is machine learning, and it's very relevant to the theme bot demo that we showed yesterday. What that refers to is really a computer's ability to learn and improve without explicitly being programmed to do so. The last one worth putting out there is big data. That is more of an input, and, and it's important to know that because what that refers to are large sets of structured and unstructured data that are often too big for any individual to actually analyze using traditional means, which lends itself to these new types of analytical techniques. It, it seems like artificial intelligence is entering the conversation a lot more mm -hmm. now. Is, is there a driver behind that? Why, why now? Why is this coming up in conversations, especially around investing? Such a good question, because in fact, machine learning algorithms have been around for quite some time. Yaz, who presented yesterday, spoke about the fact that, you know, a lot of us see Amazon Alexa as very innovative, but in fact, the first chatterbot was written in the early 1960s. So machine learning algorithms are very well established, which prompts us to ask the question, why now? From our perspective, what it really is, is the exponential increase in the volume and variety of data that we have. In fact, 90% of the world's data has been created in the last two years. You also couple that with increased um, computing power and storage capacity at lower cost, and that's created the tailwind for this conversation. What's critical is the difference be between machine learning and big data. Machine learning is about the algorithms, and as we've talked about, have been around for a while. It's the rise of big data, which is actually one of the reasons why machine learning has become so useful now. 
it, I'm guessing you have to sort of combine the two, right? You need a lot of data in order for an algorithm to learn, right? Exactly. In fact, one of the themes we talked about yesterday was that it is precisely the rise of big data which has made the utility of these algorithms so much more useful for us. Well, I think just at a basic level, and th this is obvious, it's too much data for a human or a team of humans to analyze. It, Correct? Absolutely. It, it's, it's just too much. That's one of the, the applications we talk a lot about. ThemeBot that we demoed yesterday is about um, s using a variety of, of sources of data, including news sources, company reports, broker reports, to help identify companies that exhibit certain themes, whether they be economic, demographic, environmental. If you think about the number of humans that would be needed to read all of those sources to identify companies, the increase in efficiency you get by using a technology like this that can very quickly scour all of those different um, sources of data and identify companies, you can start to understand why the application is so powerful. But but that's a new kind of data. Like historically, I mean, I came from quant over the last 25 years. You know, in the 90s when we talked about working with data, we were talking about, you know, time series returns, PEs, fundamental data that was already widely available sitting in databases somewhere. What you're talking about is much sloppier data, right? Analyst reports, annual reports, earnings announcements, press releases. That's that we I think a lot of people don't think of that as data. We think of that as just language, right? Words that people have to interpret. And so what you're talking about seems like a phase shift from data used to mean numbers in a spreadsheet, and now it can mean something as sloppy as an analyst report that's 20 pages long. That's exactly right. And in fact, it's this type of unstructured data, which is very powerful, but requires these types of techniques to really analyze. I think a good example of that that we spoke about yesterday was really, if you think of value investing, obviously a very common topic right now and very top of mind for many investors. Um, what are you obviously doing? You're looking for companies that look attractive relative to their fundamentals. We now have more information or data that we can use to help refine our earnings estimates. For example, credit card spending data, footfall traffic, satellite imagery. And so really, it's not about changing the practice of finding value companies, it's just in this example, augmenting our ability to do so with the rise of these data sources. You know, your point about machine learning sort of replacing something that a human might do, you know, back in the, again, the 80s and 90s, when we talked about sort of successful stock pickers, they would do things like do parking lot counts, right? They'd actually send analysts out to see, you know, how many people showed up at a factory before 9 a.m. to try to get a, a line on production or something like that. The Motley Fool did a lot of things like that. But you're talking about things like satellite imagery. Is that literally replacing things like you know, the, the parking lot count at a manufacturing facility? Well, you know, we firmly believe humans are still very important in this process. It's just the role they're playing and, and the importance of actually, in fact, subject matter experts goes up very high when you think about this type of investing. So the way in which we're applying these techniques with our, within our investment teams, it's about using these technologies to create scale and efficiency for our portfolio managers, not replacing our portfolio managers. The value example is a, is a, is a good one. We fundamentally are factor-based investors. That first and foremost is around research. The, the role of a researcher is still critically important. It's just making their jobs more efficient. So are they the ones determining what to ask the question about in the first place? And then the machine learning sort of helps them get the answer? Absolutely. I mean, make no mistake, the, the way in which you ask the question matters quite a lot. And so the role of a human is critically important. In fact, we spoke about yesterday the premium or importance of subject matter experts within this space. But just to be clear, and Dave will laugh because I always run this thread through just about every conversation we have. <laughs> I bring up the active versus passive. And you, you were touching on this, but... Do you envision artificial intelligence replacing active managers down the line? Does it complement what an active manager does? H how does it fit just into the investment process? I see it as a very great complement. Um, you know, there, if I think of the use cases for it, a couple of the ones we're using it right now for, um, one, I mentioned augmenting strategies. That word augmenting is, is used intentionally, where the role of a portfolio manager is still critically important. It's just using or harnessing different data sources to make what they do even better. Um, risk management's also an important one. So again, portfolio managers are still front and center in defining what it is we're trying to get exposure to, uh, but we're using these technologies to help limit unintended risks in the portfolio. For example, I think a really interesting one that brings it to life is if you think about 
to companies. Um, if you're trying to get quality exposure, for example, they could show the same exact quality metrics. But in fact, one company could be a rumor takeover target. Mm. Why is that important? Well, it's subject to event risk. If a takeover actually happens, it could jump in price. If it doesn't happen, it could fall in price. It's got binary risk to it. You can use these types of techniques to, li to remove companies that are high takeover targets from your universe. Why is that important? You're still getting exposure to the thing that a, you're hoping to get exposure to high quality without introducing that type of risk. But to your point, somebody has to tell the model that we don't want high takeover risk targets. Mm -hmm. And someone has to tell yeah. the model that we're looking for quality. There's um, still an importance of the role of a portfolio manager, not just to define the investment parameters, but also in the actual application of the technology itself. Well, a fascinating area. I just hope I have a job in five or 10 years. <laughs> Yasmin, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having it. me. That was Yasmin Daya Bilgers on artificial intelligence and investing. It really is remarkable how fast this space is evolving. I think Yasmin gave you a flavor for it there. And that stat she gave that 90% of the world's data has been produced in the past two years. I think that shows you why artificial intelligence is needed. It's just not possible for humans to process that amount of data. And I have no doubt this is going to be a topic we spend a lot more time on moving forward. Really interesting stuff here. That'll do it for this week's ETF Prime. I want to thank our exclusive sponsor, Lake Mason. You can visit legmason.com to learn more about their broad range of investment strategies. If you enjoyed this week's podcast, we would greatly appreciate if you could drop us a quick review wherever you listen to podcasts. That helps other listeners find the show. You can also send us comments on Twitter at ETF Prime. Next week, I'll be joined by Sarah Shelberg, head of U.S. iShare Sustainable ETFs. We're going to visit about the future of sustainable investing and take a look at the iShare Sustainable Core ETF lineup. And then Sean Brown, CEO of YCharts, will discuss the importance of ETF due diligence, making sure you do the proper homework before investing in ETFs. Until then, have a great week, everyone.